class series on mathematical biology and data sciences. Thank you very much. <laughs> So uh, this is jointly organized by University of Manchester, University of Liverpool, and Liverpool John Morse University. Um, and it's my absolute pleasure today to welcome Heping Lu. He is um, from Sheffield, and um, he's a professor of machine learning in um, uh, in in computer science yes, department computer in Sheffield. Yeah. So Heping had an engineering background, trained in Nanyang Technological University, Singapore, followed by a PhD from Toronto. And he is currently a Turing academic lead at the University of Sheffield. And uh, he's also a founder and lead organizer of the Turing Institute's interest group on meta learning for multimodal data. And also he organizes an annual multimodal AI workshop I think the next one is in June. Yes. I'm looking forward to attend that one. And um, Hapings research focuses on developing innovative AI methods for um, multimodal data in healthcare and beyond. And I think specifically focused on genomics and medical imaging. Um, and I believe he's going to discuss quite a few of those applications in the talk today. Indeed, yeah. And uh, over to you, Heping. Thank you very much for coming yeah. to Manchester. Thank you, Mazasat, yeah. for the invitation and uh, also for this opportunity to share our research here. Um, actually, I visited uh, Manchester, give a seminar last February. Um, therefore, um, this work will mainly consist of our recent work in the past one year and mostly our, our preprint work still um, under review or in progress. Um, firstly, a brief introduction to our group in Sheffield. We call ourselves the, the KO group. It's a knowledge aware machine learning group, a very healthy group. And our key focus is to learning from multiple data sources for better prediction and understanding. We work on a multiple modality of data. In mainly, we focus on imaging data, starting from uh, brain imaging data, which is uh, uh, basically brain functional MRI. And uh, we also work on cardiac MRI and also um, cardiac X-ray. And uh, recently, we start to work on also e ECG and uh, integrate medical report, and also uh, leveraging electronic health record. And uh, we, on the other hand, we also start to go into the biology side and work on molecule property prediction. And on the drug discovery side, we work on drug target interaction prediction. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about uh, our multimodal AI work across all these spectrums. We are going to cover about six papers. So I will start with uh, the one uh, on cardiac MRI and uh, EHR. So um, this work is uh, work that built on more like a six years of collaboration with a radiologist. And uh, in this work, we try to combine cardiac MRI and uh, electronic health record for assessing cardiac hemodyna hemodynamics. Uh, and uh, the way we work is uh, we firstly consider the Imaging modality, we, we have uh, the cardiac MRI, and we have basically two modalities. One is uh, uh, short axis. In, in cardiac MRI, there are different, different views. One is uh, the most common one is short axis, and another one is called uh, four chamber. So uh, those are the two imaging modalities. We basically take that imaging modality as a primary modality, and then we will firstly do the pre-processing on the left-hand side to register the images together. Here, we do the registration through landmarks. And uh, this landmark, we will try to use it to estimate the, 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 the confidence of the landmark detection. And then we will try to use this confidence as an approximate quality measure for the CMR image. Right? So therefore, we do not take all the image in. In the second step, we will do a little bit of sample filtering, that is, we are going to use that uncertainty measure based on the landmark detection to try to filter out some poor quality MRI images. Therefore, at the end of the second step, we have some quality CMR samples. 
And after that, in the third step, what we do is we use a multilinear principal component analysis method, which is actually uh, a method I developed uh, during my PhD, that's more than decades ago, which is a uh, interpretable and uh, linear method, uh, which uh, basically extracts features from the three-dimensional tensor representation. And after the, the third step, what we have is basically extracted CMR features based on linear methods. And in the fourth step, we will try to integrate EHR features. Um, there's lots of EHR features, and we also want to select the most useful one. Here, we use a graph attention network to select among all the available EHR features, those important ones. Therefore, at the end of the fourth step, we have selected EHR features. And at the last step, we do the fusion to combine the imaging feature and the EHR feature, and uh, then use a simple linear classifier to do the classification so that the whole process is transparent and interpretable. And uh, for the feature selection method, um, I will give you a little bit more details. Here, we use uh, the graph attention network trying to evaluate the individual EHR features for their importance. Here, there's two um, technical uh, novelty here is that uh, once we use a graph attention to compute the weight of uh, each feature by a so-called ablation uh, approach. This ablation approach is seeing that we treat the features one by one, we, we, we ask the question, if we remove this particular feature, then how much the prediction performance will be affected? If the prediction performance was uh, is affected um, significantly, then we consider this feature as significant. And so that is uh, the, the, the assumption behind the, the ablation approach. We, we, by examining the ablation performance, we try to estimate the feature importance of the EHR features. And uh, for the graph attention network, we basically um, do those kind of typical graph new network uh, embeddings. Uh, and we also use multi-head attention where we basically estimate different multi-head attention can be considered that you are trying to uh, model multiple relationships between the different nodes. And so here, if you look at the top, the network we build is basically each patient is basically a node of the network. And their uh, similarity is uh, edge. And we model the, learn the embedding of all the patients as well as their relationships. And so this, uh, the edge feature is basically we learn the label um, of the, edge as also a kind of uh, an embedding right? so a feature. So these are all weighted. Right? So we learn a learnable weight. That is really the power of the neural, neural network where we do not specify the relationship, but we, we actually learn it. Right? So, so that's the relationship will help us to optimize the performance. So that is a graph attention and the ablation approach for feature selection. So um, here on the top right, I show the, the following steps in the attention computation and the node embedding. So this is basically after we have those embeddings for the, for the uh, patients, so that is uh, that we, we call it the source. Basically they are connected by edge. So the source patient, the destination patient and their relationship, right? So we learn the embedding for all of this. And then in the second step, we will uh, try to um, estimate their attention coefficient, that is to assess how important they are. And then in the last step, we try to uh, combine the multi-head, that is multiple relationships by aggregating multiple, multiple re relationships, we have a more compact representation, a node embedding, which is really a vector representation for that particular, particular patient. So this is uh, roughly the the high level idea of this graph attention and ablation for feature selection. 
And in terms of fusion, we explore um, four approaches. I believe you know most of them. For example, early fusion, we can do it by, for example, for the imaging modality, they are captured with a similar configuration. So we can actually concatenate the raw MRI images together, right? So that is very early fusion, right? Very early fusion. And uh, we can also have intermediate fusion. That is, okay, we are not uh, combining the features right away, but we do the NPC protection, right? So NPC is just like PC applied to more like a tensor representation. <laughs> so after we try the feature, we can cut me the features, right? So that is more like feature level fusion, and we call it intermediate fusion. And the third mm -hmm. approach is, I guess, most people working deep in fusion we know as late fusion, right? So that is decision level fusion. After we make a prediction use each modality, we combine their prediction scores, right? So to the prediction. So that's a later late fusion. And what we introduce further here is a hybrid fusion, right? So because when we find to combine short access for chamber and each trial, we, we we find there are actually more choices becoming available, right? So we can actually do hybrid fusion. For example, we can first fuse the image modality through so either early fusion or intermediate fusion, that is A and B. And then after that, we select the feature and do the classification. So that will basically be a prediction. And for the EHR, we, we, we do the using EHR to do the classification, have a prediction then we combine their prediction scores, right? So this is kind of hybrid fusion because we have late fusion of the imaging modality and the EHR modality, but we also have early fusion or intermediate fusion for the imaging modality, right? So this is a more like a hybrid approach. And uh, with this novel uh, multimodal fusion approach, actually we can show that we, by using a multimodal fusion based on MPC, multilinear PC, a purely linear approach with linear class one linear SVM, actually we can get better performance than transformer approaches, right? So you can see from the unimodal, right? So this is a unimodal prediction result. You can see that indeed the transformer model performs better in terms of ROC and MCC. Also MPC approach also quite uh, give quite good results in accuracy, also competitive compared with uh, transformer. By the way, if you see the resolution um, uh, on the second column, that's because transformers have to have a specific resolution uh, as input so that they can train their uh, architecture. But for MPC, for the linear model, we are actually quite flexible, right? We can have, you can see 32 by 32 resolution and also 128 by 128 resolution. And uh, I, here I show you the, pre-model fusion results. So you can see that uh, for the MPC, if we use a late fusion with a short access for chamber and DHR, and on a lower resolution, that is we have half of the resolution of transformer, actually we can obtain um, better results over here and uh, also over there, that is hybrid fusion, right? So you can see both results actually are better than the transformer approach. But that is seen that Multi-modality give us more prediction power, and right? so to our linear methods. By leveraging more modality, actually the linear methods can outperform powerful transformer models. So this is a lesson learned from our first work. And now I move on to our second work, um, a combination of uh, X-ray and uh, ECG. So. This work is uh, basically using a variational autoencoder, and on the top left is uh, the baseline models where um, existing method, when they try to build a VAE, variational autoencoder, they, they basically pass the pair data in and try to learn representation over there. So that's pair ECG and uh, X ray in this case. What we are doing here is also making more multimodal, right? So we are not just passing the paired stream, but we have more like a tree, a tri stream of VAE, right? So what we pass in will be, we will learn both a specific stream that is only CXR, that X ray, and only ECG, and also paired. That's basically the three streams. The first stream, ECG, second stream, XR, X ray. 
and the third stream is paired, will be paired together, right? So put in your VAE. So basically, there are three VAEs, right? Three, three VAEs put in version auto encoder. And uh, in this way, we can multiple their shared features and also specific features. And so in this way, I will not go into the details, but that's roughly the key idea, right? So it took up three streams to put in the VAE so that uh, we can learn both specific features and also their shared features. And in this way, we can have the three laws as the CSR, ECG, and their paired uh, um, VAE laws, right? So then we try to minimize the joint laws. And uh, this can help us to make more, uh, more, more, make the VAE more powerful in the sense that, for example, in the learning, we have both ECG and uh, XR. Um, the, the CXR, and but in the prediction, we can leverage the framework to pre make prediction with only ECG or X3 available, right? That is, although our learning has both XR, X3, and the ECG, but in the prediction, we can make prediction if only ECG is available or if only X3 is available. And so, and uh, we can show that by learning their joint representation, specific re representations, it can, it, the performance better compared with if you just use single modality in single modality prediction. So you can see again, right? So we have considered more modalities when we combine these two different modalities. And you may ask why we, the first work is on CMR and now you're on X3. Why you work on X3, right? It's not CMR. The reason is about the cost, right? Because CMR, MR is more expensive and X3 is much cheaper. Right, so um, here I show some results. For example, these are this is one of our early work on CMR and EHR combination, where indeed we have much better performance, right? But the cost is also high. For example, not every hospital will have an MR machine, but the hospitals have X3 machines are much more, right? So therefore, if we we show that through our approach combining the X3 and the ECG, actually we can improve the performance. Uh, to be very close to the one with the the, the expensive MRI modality. So that is a, 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 a basically a primary motivation for us to study the uh, X3 and the ECG uh, combination. They are of much lower cost. And, yes, please. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the joint modalities, how do you calculate this joint modality? Is it through the VAE or you sort of Yes, it's through the AT50, the, the, the baseline, right? So if one is Towards this towards the screen, that is basically using the, the baseline, the, which is already existing work. Okay. Yeah, but then eventually we combine the laws yeah, the to optimize the joint. One quick question, one more. Yeah, no problem. So, um, what if that you, if you have more data on one of the streams and almost no data on the other ones, can you sort of control it? Or how do you know that actually that it is improving the multiple information instead of having more data on one stream, but having more modalities is helping? This is a very good question, right? So that is actually our current work. In this work, we we have paired ECG and X3, so therefore the number of samples for ECG and XR are the same. And so this is a simple case, but you also have lots of data you haven't utilized, right? So actually it's, it's more like one magnetic variant. Uh, so that is what we are currently focusing on is how to leverage the unpaired data. Right? So that's, that's a much more challenging problem. And that's a very good question. Uh, we, we are still working on that. For this particular work, it's okay. Yeah. All right, that's a very good question. Yeah, thank you. The third work is to, to leverage both F3 and uh, um, medical reports. And so uh, in this work called MedSleep, what we are doing is we build, we do a pre-training um, of uh, F3 and also leverage their medical report because usually when radiologists have a F3, there will be a accompanying medical report. Right? So the radiologist will write about what is in that tree, right? So what we have observed. Um, and uh, here we want to use that re report and the X-ray to improve the learning. Right? But typically people just use X-ray. But there are also reports, right? Why don't you use a report to enhance the learning and, uh, and prediction? So that is the motivation of this approach. And here we also realize that there's two kinds of information in the X-ray or in the report. Uh, one is about anatomy, that you're talking about your body part, 
Another one is about pathology, right? So usually you talk about, okay, here you have something that is not right, right? So then basically we, we consider the two primary information over there, two stream of primary information there. One is anatomy and one is pathology, right? One is pathology. And here we are trying to disentangle these two kinds of information, one is anatomy and one is Pathology. We want to disentangle it in two modalities. One is on X ray, the other one is on uh, the medical reports. And uh, so that is uh, the, 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 basically the, the problem we, we are trying to solve, right? We want to also try to align the, the imaging information with the text information from the report better. And uh, here um, is one of uh, uh, the key uh, motivation for one of the innovation we have is for, for, for typical constructive, lear constructive learning is that one problem in this kind of uh, in this kind of X-ray and medical report multi uh, bimodality problem is that when you have X-ray, there will be multiple tuples of uh, multiple facts that can extract from uh, the, the medical report, right? So that is really this case, right? So you will have multiple, just from the, the radiology report, they can extract multiple facts from there, right? So, okay, your left rib is, have something wrong, okay, here has something wrong. Of course, we don't want to see that, right? So we hope there's nothing. But you already, in that medical report, you have multiple facts, and that makes the corresponding from the image with, with the text tuple, those kind of facts, those kind of knowledge, be one to many, right? One to many. And that makes the, 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 the learning and the correspondence a little bit complicated. And what we do here is instead of one to many, we will try to, based on the text encoding, right? The text encoding will have multiple tuples and multiple embedding. We try to leverage them and try to aggregate them into a prototype and uh, try to make the correspondence between the image modality and the text modality to be one to one, and so that will make our learning much easier. Um, and uh, that is uh, uh, basically this problem. Is on one hand we need to learn from image, on the other hand we need to learn from text. Right? So therefore, you can see here I show the the learning for image on the left hand side and for uh, text for report on the right hand side. So there's a few uh, key technical uh, contributions here. Why is the for, for typical contrastive learning, uh, which I mentioned just now, that you try to make the correspondence between imaging and the text domain to be one to one. Otherwise, it'd be more like one to many. And there's also a, a image contrastive learning that you try to make the the pathology and uh, the um, so at the bottom is a pathology modeling, and at the top is anatomy modeling. Right? So we also try to make sure these two are aligned through another contrastive learning method. Right? So that is, um, we have no time to get the details, but this is a high level concept. Right? So basically, we consider anatomy and pathology separately, but also consider their relationship, trying to make them align well, to so make them align well. And for the task embedding, we are we we basically also treat the anatomy and the, the, the pathology separately. Right? So that's also we can see the existence uh, a label or, or variable there. That is to say, for example, whether uh, left rib has deformation. Right? So that if it's zero, there's no deformation. If it is one, that means the left rib has deformation. Right? So and uh, here we also have a uh, existence. Label and right? whether that pathology exists in this patient's X ray. And this one is whether that exists in the medical report. Right? So these are the modeling three key, key uh, factors one is anatomy, one is pathology, one is existence. Right? So by these three modeling, you're talking about a fact, for example, your left rib has deformation or your left rib has no deformation. Right? So those are the information we're trying to encode and to, to make a correspondence. By doing this joint imaging and text training, we show, um, we demonstrate their, their um, performance and their power in three tasks. First one is classification, that is to predict a disease. And second, grounding. Grounding is trying to find correspondence between the imaging and the text, right? So that is 
if I, 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 I I, in the report, I say, oh, left rib we have deformation. Can you find the respective part in the imaging that uh, indicate the left rib have deformation, right? So that is called the, the second word called grounding, right? And, the grounding. and we also use it for, for segmentation. That is just use a report to help you to segment the x ray much better, right? So that is a performance for the uh, segmentation. That's um, one data set, that's another data set. And uh, we show that uh, by this kind of uh, disentanglement and pre-training, uh, we can improve the performance on three tasks. One is classification, one is grounding, and another one is segmentation. And this is uh, about uh, the cardiac <laughs> problems. Yeah. And uh, then yeah. after, yes, please, question, yeah, good. In terms of speaking of the vocabulary, so for example, the deformation, so do you sort of redefine this vocabulary? We have a lot like more degree. Yeah, this is based on prompts. So basically, we will uh, um, use a prompt saying that does the left rib have deformation? Then you try to search in the report to see whether it's yes or no. Okay. Right. So so here there's a that's the test encoding part. Here we use some language model to do the prompt saying that uh, maybe one of the questions is does the left rib have deformation? Then if you Try to understand the report to answer you. Yes, it has, or no, it doesn't have. Right? So it didn't mention whatever, right? So, uh, so that is how how we we, we do do the extract the information. All right, that's a very good question again. Thank you. And so these are the three works about cardiac imaging about the modeling the heart. Right. So we covered uh, um, four uh, modalities: called CMR, X-ray. Imaging ECG and uh, UHR and uh, also medical reports. And now I will move on to the bio side, talk about uh, one work we, we um, have developed for molecule um, property prediction. Um, here we look at the multimodality slightly differently, right? So that is for molecule. We view it, uh, um, molecule can be represented in, in, in different ways, right? So one way is 2D topological graph. And we review that as one modality. And they also have a 3D geometric representation, right? So therefore, 2D and 3D can be viewed as two modalities. And in this work, we call geometric uh, geometry aware line graph transformer. We we model molecule properly through these two different modalities, 2D representation and 3D representation. Okay? So we will uh, model those by uh, both by line graph transformations, and two D line graph and three D line graph, and uh, by modeling them, them with a graph, we can find the features for typical graph neural networks, and uh, also to have uh, encode other information like the scaling distance. Right? For example, for three D geometry, you can there's also information about distance in three D space between an atom. Right? So therefore, you can see atomic distance encoding over here. And uh, for the two D, it's more about the relative position, right? So therefore, you see the eigenvector position encoding over there. Um, and uh, for the three D information, you also have the angle, right? So in three D space, uh, there's uh, different atoms. There are angles between them, right? So therefore, we also encode the angle information. There's also angle encoding over there to be uh, integrated into the graph. And uh, for the two D. We also have a past lens and the past node, right? So that is in 2D, we, we, it's more topological graph. Therefore, we also try to encode the, the 2D past um, and uh, um, do the embedding, right? So therefore, you can see, we try to consider various kind of information um, through the 2D, 2D modeling and 3D modeling. And then, after we have leveraged all this information, we will then um, looking at looking at them together, right? So that's more like the separate embedding. But we also you see we also look at their relationships, right? So so look at their intermodality relationship. Right? So again, in here, right? So we can see that we have a, a, a more like a, we consider three losses, right? So one is just about three D two three. Another is about 2D, another is about their relationship. Right? So that is a 
have a quite similar flavor with our early work about uh, five stream uh, VEE. Right? So that is uh, uh, the high level um, idea of what we are doing over here. And this is uh, um, a little bit of technical details about uh, the the line graph, right? So this is how uh, we the, the reason we we convert, for example, this original three D graph into a line graph is to make them make the the neural net graph neural net graph structures be similar for two D and three D, right? So that they are more later on. You you remember that the interrelationship we can it can be more. Can be easier to, to model their relationships. So this is called a line graph, where we we convert the original 3D graph into a line graph. A line graph is basically each node corresponding to one edge, as the one pair of edge. So that is actually each of them. Each node is about uh, two nodes, and they are connection a relation. It is called a line graph. And uh, that is uh, the the graph transformer um, architecture. On the left hand side is three D. On the right hand side is two D. Right? So you can see that's why we do the line graph transformation because in this way we can utilize the same backbone uh, architecture. Right? That is yes, it's different. The three D has a point distance, and two D you have position encoding, but they are they are largely similar. By using the line graph as common transformation, we are able to, to use a similar architecture for the 3D and for 2D, then later on we can integrate the information together. Right? So therefore you can see these are based on similar uh, similar uh, architecture. Right? So there's a, we, we, we leverage the into the, the distance, the angle information, and here we we uh, from the topological graph we encode the pass node and the pass. Uh, lens information, um, and here uh, we this is also more kind of foundation model where we build a pre-train a large model, then we can use it by a simple fine tuning on different tasks. Right, for example, here um, we studied twelve tasks, and uh, uh, we we our um, our model performs uh, the best in eleven out of the twelve tasks. And here we show two of the examples. Um, one is uh, um, in, for the DDPT data set is to try to predict the barrier um, perme uh, permeability. And the second one is uh, um, um, to predict the water uh, solubility, right? So that we try, we simplify into binary classification for the virilization. And uh, this is uh, the, the graph former, our proposed uh, approach. And uh, uh, these two are more like state of art from ICR. And uh, uh, this is a case where there's no pre-training, that is no foundation model. You just train on the data, your target data set. So that is uh, uh, one of the uh, work on molecule property prediction. And the next, I want to share one of the work that actually I talked about this you know, in my last visit in February last year, um, called drug ban. Um, this work is is to trying to predict the the interaction between drug and target, whether they will um, have um, interaction or they will not have interaction. Right. So, because when we develop a drug, we will want the, the, the drug to interact with the molecule so that it will have effect. Right. If they have no effect, then basically the drug is not effective. Here, the two modalities is basically one is the drug and one is um, the, the protein. And uh, the drug is basically a molecule structure and protein is a long sequence, like we represent it, represent it as, a, as a sequence. And uh, for the drug, we, we basically learn it through a simple graph convolutional neural network. And for the protein, we use uh, 1D convolution in your new network to learn uh, the, the features. And in this way, we can learn the features for different segments of the protein. That is uh, um, basically each part will have a correspondence with the original protein. So therefore, these are more like the features for segments of the protein. And uh, on top of that, we also have uh, the, the features for substructure of the drug. Yes, substructure of the drug. And therefore, by having these more like the substructure features, we can do a 
modeling is quite relevant to your, your relationship, their interaction. And that's why you call it a bilinear attention map that is trying to a row, for example, the row is uh, the, the drug and the column is uh, the protein. Then each of them, each of the cell is trying to modeling the relationship between drug and the target. And here we also use multi head. What does that mean? It's just uh, we think their relationship are not just one kind of relationship, but there are multiple kind of relationship. I right? therefore we use multiple heads. And then after that, we try to aggregate the information and the construct the feature, like feature vector and do the prediction. And here, there's another innovation here is, is doing domain adaptation because in this paper, what we care about is not the in-domain prediction, right? So that is not the prediction on your training data. You do random split or whatever split and then, then do the prediction on your training data because that's not what pharma uh, interested. Right? You really, what we interested in is the cross-domain prediction, right? So you train our data and if you do the prediction, on uh, 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 data of different domains, whether it can still perform well. I will not go into the details because I talked about it the last year in February, but uh, what is interesting is to see after the publication of this work, this work in this month, uh, about 10 days ago, an Asian machine intelligence published a reproducible, reproducibility report of our work. And uh, in this work, what they do is they apply and uh, highlight two results. Well, on the one hand, because uh, Reproducibility, reproducibility report, we have tried to uh, study how reproducible our paper is, for example, uh, by using uh, even more different splits, or, or you see in the cross domain, we do clustering of the protein and drugs. We also try different splitting and clustering uh, approaches right, to show whether our conclusion still holds. And after that reproducibility study, what they do is they, they apply our model to new data set, data that, that we haven't studied yet. And uh, uh, that is uh, the, the interaction for drug party interaction prediction. They show that uh, it, just by applying our model, we develop, develop on, on two data sets, one is file SNAP, one is uh, uh, binding DB. And we can do quite good prediction that is uh, uh, um, evaluated by p values through two different ones, uh, uh, the, the, the drug and target, uh, when they are not, uh, um, this is when they are not reacting and not uh, binding, and the other one they are binding, right? So we can differentiate them significantly. And uh, what the author did is also try to generalize our task from drug target interaction prediction to another two new tasks. One is the uh, um, cell line and drug interaction. Another one is a mutation. Um, I think it's mutation and drug uh, um, association or something like that. Right? So they, they, they study our cross domain modeling capability. Right? So what it shows here is that domain adaptation can consistently improve the performance of those kind of interaction prediction on a totally different but related problem. And why is cell, cell line and why is mutation? So uh, then I will talk about the last work. And um, um, yes, please. So just question about Jack Bank thing uh, about the protein bit. Uh, I'm sorry, I apologize. The question is naive because I never done with no uh, machine learning on protein structures. But I didn't realize that your your input data is protein residues, which I believe really you said is protein. I think the sequence of protein amino yes. acids. Yeah. Uh, I was Smiles, wondering. Yeah. I was wondering if it would be better to if you have a tertiary if if tertiary information about a tertiary structure for protein is available, would be better would be better better source of the input data. Because it's kind of more relevant to what a water proteins will be doing in real life. Yeah, I think um, uh, additional information will always help, right? So I think that's uh, basically a further research problem, where where you can consider that more like a two D versus three D, right? So as additional modality, right? So as a different representation of uh, uh, the protein, and uh, that can we can have one more branch over here to model that information and try to aggregate that information into prediction. Yeah. I do think it's feasible in good direction as well. I see. Oh, thank you. All right, that's a good question. So lastly, uh, we present our uh, work on, on bring SMI. And this is uh, uh, another non-deep work, right? So we didn't use much uh, uh, neural network here. It's, it's quite a simple uh, linear models. Um, we call it a group specific discriminant analysis, right? So here the problem is more scientific, right? So it's not about the disease 
prediction is about to understand uh, a brain literalization, um, and uh, more specifically, it's about sex specific brain literalization. And that is to say that male and female, their brain literalization is different. And so how can you model the difference between male and uh, female uh, brain literalization? And what we produce here is more like a, a, a dual classification um, framework for modeling these group specific uh, differences. Here, if we take the multimodal point of view, it's quite different kind of multimodal, right? So it's not what you see just now. It's, more, it's about viewing the fMRI from two axes. Why is our brain left versus right, right? Left brain versus right brain, they are different. That's why, that's what the lateralization is talking about. Our left brain and right brain are different. How can we model the difference? And another one is sex, about male and female, right? Male and female brain lateralization are different. I right? so in psychology, whatever we have, understand that there are quite some different characteristics between male and female. So how we do that is uh, we, we construct a more like two level of classification. So there's two machine learning problems in this whole pipeline. Uh, starting from the time series, that's what is the fMRI about. fMRI is more like a, more signals. It's about imaging, but it's more sig more like signal than image. Right? So it's about the 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 um, signals across time from our brain. That is a uh, functional MRI. Right? Therefore, originally what we look like is time series based, and the process usually this is not our innovation. That's a standard practice. Is to build the brain network. Right? So that is. Fundamentally, what we do is to, to compute the correlation between the time series, right? So from different regions of the brain, we call our lives, right? So the brain will be basically clustered, um, we call oscillation into different regions, and then compute the average time series correlation from different regions of our brain. Also, after that, we have a brain network. Right? So let's talk about how correlated is this part of my brain with that part of my brain. And uh, after that, we will do this kind of lateralization and also sex specific study. And so what we do is that we will view the brain at left and right, and then we will study them separately. So we want to start brain lateralization. How the left brain different from the right brain? And then uh, we will build the training set by, by the, the training set is about left and right, and the test set is also about left and right. And you can see for each person, we have left hand half and right half. So if their left brain is in the thing set, then their right brain is in the test set either otherwise. So here we, we, we propose, um, propose two levels of um, classification. The first level is about left versus right. So we want to build a platform so that we can Give me one of the brain networks, we can tell whether this is from the left side of the brain or it is from the right side of the brain. So that is what the first state, state of classification is doing, right? So we want to differentiate giving a brain network, whether this is from the left side of our brain or from the right side of the brain. And we do this actually twice, once focus on the male and once focus on the female. Right? So after that, we have two models. One is male-specific models. Another one is female-specific models. And then we will treat the model as an input for a second state of classification. That is, we want to classify this model, whether it is from male or from a female. Right? So that is a second order classification. So our second uh, step is also a linear logistic regression uh, um, prediction trying to classify given the model, we want to tell whether this model is for male or is for female. Right? So we don't want to tell from the model to see that this model is a female model. That model is a male model, a model, right? So that is a problem. And for the left versus right classification, we, we didn't use conventional method because the conventional method, which um, conventional approach is if you want male specific model, you train only on male data. 
if you want female specific data uh, model, you train only on female data. What we are doing is different. Because we find that you already find models that are not discriminated. Right? So what we do is that we will use both data from both sex, but we focus on one of the sex. Right? So that is um, here, for example, if our target, we want to learn male specific models, we will also use the data from female. Right, so what we are doing is that we will, in the training, we will know the left and right label for the target group that is for male in this example. But for female, we must, that is, we assume that we do know the labels, right? We have their brain network in the training sample, and we do not know their left versus right, right? So, and uh, what the, the, the female data do is trying to do a, a regularization. The objective is to make the prediction to depend on the sex, right? So to depend on whether you are male or you are female, okay? So that is, we make the prediction to be dependent on the sex that is female or male. And then we jointly maximize the likelihood of dependence, right? So that is a prediction. That is whether I can tell this is left or right, it depends on the sex, right? So it depends on if my model is for male, then I can do well on males left and right. If I'm a female model, I can predict better on predicting females left, left versus right mode, uh, brain, right? So that is the dependence on the grouping factor, right? Depending on you are male or female, the performance will be different, right? So that is what we want, that's a group specific prediction. On the other hand, of course, we want to maximize the labels. That is, we want to maximize for the target group, for the male, we want to make sure that uh, um, we can maximize the likelihood of the left and left, left versus right prediction. So that is our result, right? You can see this is uh, the, the lambda regularization parameter for the group dependence, right? So when it is zero, the prediction do not depend on the group. Right, so and you can see from the test accuracy of left versus left versus right, the prediction accuracy is uh, almost the same, uh, regardless you are male or female. Right, so therefore that is a group that is a group uh, that's not a group specific model, right? Because in the prediction accuracy, the model is the same for male or female. And when we increase our regularization, that try to increase the dependence of the model on the sex. We can see the the prediction outcome becomes diverged, and if it's a male specific model, the prediction for the male model that is we can do well on predicting the male's left and versus right brain, but do poorly on that on, on female one and otherwise. Right? So this is to tell that we build a group specific model. Right? So if our model is male specific, we perform well on male data. If we are female specific, we perform on female state, right? In this way, we have a more like group specific model. And this is showing, we, we, we examine some baselines and also our models, the correlation between the, the models you have learned, that is basically the ways, these are all linear models, right? So uh, compute their, their correlation. You can see that when uh, for the baseline model, either univariate or, or multivariate baselines, we are highly correlated with, with our also our lambda equal to zero, right? That's group non-specific model, right? So they are highly correlated. That's they learn similar models, right? So and uh, when our lambda is higher, we this is a lower tangle, we can see that indeed we learn group specific model, right? So that is the correlation uh, of uh, between the 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 models um, when we increase. The 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 uh, lambda, that is the dependence factor on the group grouping factor, right? That is when we have stronger re regularization, the modules learned are more and more different, right? So for male and female, they are more and more different. When it's zero, they are highly correlated, right? It's either male or female, it's the same model. But when we increase the regularization, we have different models. So that is about our work on multimodal AI.
um, from heart to, to molecules to brains. Um, and uh, um, this is, of course, not uh, the thread of my work, it's really a team of our um, uh, research students and the postdocs who have uh, done uh, this uh, excellent work on working on so many different kinds of modalities um, and uh, uh, different problems. And uh, um, of course, we hope to get connected with you. Uh, you can either connect on LinkedIn or, or Twitter with us. And uh, um, our, like I said, the multimodal AI is uh, one of our primary focus. So therefore, um, from uh, 2022, we, we created a Turing interest group on uh, meta learning for multimodal data. Right? If you're not yet a member, you can get a QR code and join our Turing interest group. And then in November 2022, we organized our first uh, in-person event. It's a workshop on open source AI software for healthcare. And uh, um, that is at the Alan Turing Institute. And in June last year, we organized our uh, first workshop on multimodal AI. We also created a multimodal AI community uh, mailing list managed by ourselves, the Turing group was managed by Turing. They are not real-time updated. Um, and uh, last November, we organized our first multimodal AI research sprint. So uh, through that effort, we, we group our, our uh, domains into six domains. And now we work on a perspective paper on multimodal AI that's trying to lay the vision and the, the, the directions of uh, the multimodal AI community. And uh, uh, also in March, uh, that is uh, more like one month ago, we have our first multimodal AI um, community forum, right? So we, in the future years, our plan is to we will have more like a, a consistently organized these three kind of uh, um, meetings. The one is the, the spring, which is a very small scale, um, like during the only can have comedy 45 people. Right? And also have an online forum that is to enable those who cannot come in person with us to interact particularly for international researchers. And we are also going, going to organize our workshop in person in Sheffield annually. And uh, therefore, um, here I just uh, invite all of you and your network to join us in two months time uh, in Sheffield to have our second multimodal AI uh, workshop. And uh, we have confirmed the three speakers. Our objective is to make it as multimodal as possible. Um, therefore, we have experts from uh, Microsoft who work on material. If you hear about uh, the math gen, I saw that Microsoft recent big news on media about uh, the reduced use, use of uh, lithium in, in batteries. So he's leading that project. And we have Maria Ricardo, who is an NLP expert. And we also have uh, uh, Natalia uh, on the environment, ethics, and the sustainability. Um, I'm currently talking to one from uh, um, our future here, so hopefully we can have confirmed the fourth uh, keynote speaker as soon as possible. Right? So these are the six, six domains that we have identified. Health here is undoubtedly the biggest one. Usually, uh, when we open an event, almost half are from health care. Right? So half are from health care, the rest. Uh, uh, are relatively smaller, right? So, social science, humanity, and engineering science, and environment and sustainability, and also finance and economics. Uh, so, that's it. Yeah, welcome you to uh, get connected with, with us and uh, um, also join us in Sheffield um, and have more uh, interactions and let our research be more multimodal. Thank you.